Welcome everybody to Habitat Now. My name is Aaron Shea, and I, we have an honor today of uh, welcoming Latches, our voyage up to this Habitat Zoom. Uh, Latches is joining us from California. He's going to give us a, a glimpse into his studio and a talk. He's, he's put together a great presentation I'm really excited for, and I'm glad you all can join us today. Um, starting the presentations, we have some videos. Uh, Latches went ahead and produced a piece uh, walking around his studio, so we can kind of get a more, a better glimpse of what his studio looks like without having the camera be all over the place. So, uh, yeah. Lachazar, before we start, do you want to say hello? Well, good morning. Uh, actually, morning is here, but probably a lot of you are on the East Coast. So, good morning, good day. Uh, thank you for joining, and um, I'll be very happy to show you around what's happening here and uh, how things are and uh, how my studio is. Whoever uh, have any questions, uh, I'll be here to answer them. Yes, feel free to unmute yourself and ask yeah. questions. Obviously not during the video portions, but the rest at any time. All right, I'm gonna take control of your screens and I'm gonna start um, this PowerPoint presentation, which primarily starts with these videos. Give me one second to kick over to it. Um, make sure everybody's muted, please. If you're not muted, please mute yourself. And I'm gonna take over my screen and share. You guys can all see Lachazar. Lachazar, you see yourself? Yep, you can unmute yourself, Lachazar, it's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, see great. Myself, yeah. All right, great. Good, good, good. All right, here we go, guys. This is the tour of Lachazar. This is the introduction first, and we'll go from here. Enjoy, and if you guys have any questions, let's ask them after. I start drawing until something comes out of it. In the 1980s, Lachazar Boyajev grew up in the stark world of communism. As an artist, he dreamed of creating his art without restrictions. During the communist times, uh, it was a dictatorship and uh, you did not have any freedom. I knew that the only way that I could do my art is in a free country. Lachazar made a choice. He escaped from Bulgaria, but then languished for months in a refugee camp. You have to leave everything behind, uh, all your relatives and friends. Sometimes you have to go through a drastic change and uh, risk it all for the future. Today, he expresses his gratitude for liberty in his art. I like to bring beauty to people's life. Glass is a wonderful material because it's very beautiful, very pure, very clean, but it's also very fragile. The process is extremely long, but it's magical. Liberty is very fragile also. You have to work for it because you can lose it very easily. That was great, Lachazar. Give us a real glimpse. All right, here is Lachazar's process to give you an idea how he works. A short.
That was also impressive. You have great production work, Elachazar. <laughs> yeah, that is uh, just a short uh, video, like two minutes, uh, but the documentary is about one hour. So right. This is just the process of the work done. Yes, for those of you that received the email with the homework in it, you should have watched the entire thing before coming today. I'm sure all of you did. And if not, you can always check it out later. It's a very impressive uh, presentation. Um, this is Lachazar's tour. This is a longer video, so, but it's, it, it was just filmed recently and gives you an idea of Lachazar's space. Hi, um, I'm Lachazar Boyajif and I uh, want to show you around my studio. Today's uh, a really hot day in Northern California, about 95 degrees, I would say. So I'll just show you around to see where my workspace is. As we enter here, uh, you see actually one of my doors, the only one actually I've done ever. Uh, it's a cast piece that it's about 220 pounds, just the glass itself, uh, encased into a metal fitting and the door could be pretty much standard size. It could be uh, installed in a different places and even for the outdoors as well. So this is the little office and uh, a little showroom that I have here with my largest piece ever that I have done. And this piece is uh, way above my height as you can see and it's 660 pounds heavy and uh, it's unbelievably difficult to do a single casting of this size. And uh, it was done in Czech Republic, not in my studio in Czech Republic, and uh, I'm really happy with it. And there are some other pieces that I have done, and uh, you could see uh, around the different. I love actually, particularly this torso, I call it the dancer. Uh, it's a great piece, I love it. It's one of my favorites. And uh, this is uh, the other side, is uh, my little studio where I do my drawings, my ideas, uh, where I'll come and I draw all the different uh, drawings and sculpt here as well. And there's some uh, new idea that I have and I would like to pursue this piece and uh, this one. And I have another one underneath. It's uh, also different uh, type of work. And another one here. I just draw a lot. But, uh, when it comes to, I choose one of those four drawings, let's say I chose this one piece particularly that I will pursue and uh, design. So I have a lot of smaller drawings of my little pieces and uh, there is also on this side uh, the different uh, colors of glass that uh, I could choose. These are color samples that I could use. And this is one of the oldest pieces that I have, actually. It's 20 years old, maybe. 21. And I, I like that piece. Anyway, so... Let's walk further out and see. Go to the workshop where uh, it's all done. Castings and blindings. So, this is the first studio actually. Uh, 
I usually photograph my own for hours, so it is the photo booth that I have and I shoot everything here. So from here we we'll go to the area where there's some models here and uh, the cold working area where I usually finish the work. I, I have all those uh, grinding wheels, uh, cutting wheels, uh, engravers, uh, uh, pretty much all uh, cold working uh, needs that I have to finish the sculpture. Anyway, yeah, this is a work in progress. It's still not finished. It's just, uh, it all has to be actually cut and ground uh, by hand using pieces of glass with grit and some diamond, real tiny tools. And you have to pretty much go through all the lines. And it is uh, it is a tedious work. It takes a long time to be able to make the line perfect because it comes out of the mold that it's uh, cracked and uh, fractured and not perfect at all. So it, it does take a while to get it to a point that it's really nice and beautiful. Anyway, so that is the cold working area for the glass. And actually those little cubes that you saw, uh, something new and uh, that I tried to do when all the COVID started. I wanted to do uh, something else different. And just remember going back in time uh, in the 1988 to 97, I was for 10 years doing cold working. I was doing cutting, grinding, polishing and gluing and gluing the pieces with filters. Uh, glass uh, glass filters in between to give the color and it uh, really carries out a lot and I'm in blue and the piece is blue <laughs> so how can you go wrong with that <laughs> anyway so yeah these are limited edition pieces that uh, um, I have uh, even through the gallery through Habitat Gallery uh, you can see that those pieces are there available for sale and there is the one of the kilns, that's the large kiln in the back. Uh, it is about 88 inches wide. No, 88 inches wide, yeah. And about 36 inches uh, deep. And uh, there's another kiln. And uh, let's move around here. It is a, there is another kiln, big 4 by 4 feet, and that's my biggest helper, yeah? It really does the hard work for me in a lot of times because pieces get heavy, and easy to move around. And then we have the, this machine, but it's uh, great for grinding larger surfaces, uh, grinding and polishing. So and, and it uses these types of wheels that are diamond wheels that you can change and it rotates and uh, it's manually you know, with the hands, not fully automatic. But it is, uh, you can change different grits of diamonds uh, from very rough to very fine and at the end polishing. So the whole thing could be polished on that machine. Like that door, the back of that door that uh, we started with, that was done all here. It's about, you can do eight by four feet piece. That's all, the whole surface to be ground and polished. Anyway, some sand blasters and, you know, a lot of, a lot of equipment, as you can see. So, and uh, yeah, that's, uh, poster from my first uh, exhibition back in Bulgaria 12 years ago I decided to do it because uh, I started there that's in the Academy of Art in Bulgaria the gallery there so I started everything from there and I decided to go back and do a show there 
So that was very good and very successful as well. And now let's go upstairs to go to the, one of the members of the family, Angel. <laughs> she said hello. Uh, anyway, this is the, our living area, living space. Uh, as you can see, uh, there's also another glass table, uh, clear porch from both sides. Uh, and uh, that's our kitchen and uh, living room and, and a gallery as well. So that's how we live. We live in a, in a gallery, living with my babies over the outdoor. And uh, so I. I have pretty much all of my work out. And I don't have anything in crates sitting in storage anywhere. So they're all exposed. By the way, it's about 200, over 200 years old. A beautiful tree. And that's our backyard. We have a relaxed time whenever we can. And we just had a wedding two weeks ago. My son got married right here, and this is the pergola that was especially good for them. Well, that's about it, I would say. I think that covers the whole studio and uh, the house. And if you have any questions, you know who to call. <laughs> was great Lachazar. Um, we're all moving in now that's what I, I can tell you that the place is amazing and uh, the space is amazing um, before we move on to Lachazar's presentation I just want to mention that Lachazar's show is up on artsy.net I will put uh, a link in the chat and you'll get one via email if you're on our emailing list if not let me know I'd love to for you to be on it and I'm gonna stop sharing right now and let Lachazar take over all right so let me get my presentation so I could start. There we are. Uh, the whole idea behind everything, it's freedom for me, is the most important thing there is. So I had to escape from the communist time and leave my parents there uh, just to be free because without freedom, you cannot do anything correct and uh, there is my little presentation uh that's me during the you gotta have you share your screen latches i was still staring at you yeah yep go ahead and click the oh, share wait, screen wait, button wait. and choose your screen you don't see the presentation nope we're still looking at you you haven't shared your screen yet oh let's see oh share screen there you go there you go i'm not <laughs> that good at that i'm sorry <laughs> Okay, so now choose your screen and press share. Yeah, share screen. 
How disabled attend this screen Aha, this is my fault. All right, now try it again. Okay. All right. All right, now go ahead and share your screen. We, have, we still haven't seen it yet. Okay. Share. There you go. Perfect. All right, let's see. First, uh, start with the presentation then. All right, we're on there journey. You see now? We see journey to freedom. All right. So that's uh, me. Uh, when I was a little boy, we were always uh, had to go to some big uh, manifestations. So people were obliged to go, and I was. Uh, uh, some communist uh, times that uh, the days that they had uh, from the old times, uh, they still, I mean, I don't know what to say, but uh, anyway, it was, we were obliged to go to these demonstrations, peaceful demonstration and just parade, like parading around. And um, that's me with my father. Uh, I was not very happy to see the communists on the stage, as you can see. And uh, my father was a free thinker. And I think I got it from him, my idea of freedom that uh, you have to uh, really strive to do that. He was an art photographer and uh, a free thinker. And that's me also at the same age, pretty much looking at the uh, store where they say paint brushes and paints and I always wanted to draw. I drew since I was very little and uh, became a musician after that uh, and after I could not uh, actually get into the music school be because none of my family were communists so i had a hard time with that but then i got back to my drawings and uh, decided to go to the art academy so i really worked hard and was able to get in and uh, i worked uh, uh, in the ceramic studio for one year and then i transferred there were some uh, uh, student uh, exchange programs between the communist countries and uh, one was uh, mislabeled as uh, packaging glass and uh, I decided to try something else because I wanted to get out of from Bulgaria and they said okay I signed up and there's another person signed up for it and uh, Little that I know, I was uh, chosen because I had a better grades. And um, I had no idea where I was going. Uh, there was no glass in Bulgaria at all. And uh, I had no clue. I was expecting that I'll be designing, uh, you know, different glassware only and things. And I landed in the studio of Libensky without knowing it. Uh, it was just like unbelievable experience. And of course, uh, it changed my life. Uh, after studying for six years there in Prague with him, I graduated 85 and uh, finally we were able to escape with my first wife then um, to America. So I came here and I started working uh, full time for a glass studio, Stephen Maslak in uh, Greenbrae, California, in Marin County also, and uh, worked there for three years. And then I started my own studio in Oakland, uh, California, uh, a little shop with only cold working equipment. And uh, I was so happy that I was able to get my own studio. I was working many hours a day. I remember when I did the transition, I work, uh, three days, 10 hours uh, a day for uh, Maslak and three hour, three days or four days for myself, 10 hours. So I was working really hard and producing a lot of uh, work. Actually, the first year I was able to make, I think 50, 55 pieces. So it's like one a week I was working really hard and then uh, I want to show you in the first piece that I ever sold was here, uh, this one. And um, 
Um, whatever I could find, I couldn't find much glass uh, at those days in the 80s. It was very hard, different. And these are the first pieces. And this is the first piece I sold actually to a glass collector. I was attending uh, the first uh, Glass Art Society conference that I attended was in Kent, Ohio, 1988. And um, I remember having this photo with me and I stapled the business card behind it and uh, I was uh, giving it away to people. And then one couple came to me and said, do you, we're glass collectors and uh, we would like to see if you have this piece. And I say, yeah, sure. I have it in the trunk of my car. So <laughs> it was a funny experience. Uh, and then we went to the parking lot. I opened that. I put the, on the car, I put the towel that I was having those in and um, put it on and say, oh, we like it. We want to buy it. And, I, and they say, how much? And I never sold the piece, so I didn't know what to say. And I tried to figure out, you know, how much the conference cost and the plane ticket and have a little extra for myself. And I said, 950. And they say, sure. And that was, they wrote me a check right there, took the piece, and that was my first sale ever to Baxt, Milton Baxt. Um, they passed away, both of them. Uh, so that was my first experience with Sherry. So, I was uh, starting from clear glass and then I started doing some uh, 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 more elaborate pieces with uh, optical glass and uh, different filters and colored and some dichroic filters. Um, so I was doing that for about uh, from 98 to, no, from 88 to 98, that's uh, 10 years. 10 years before I started doing the cast work and made quite a few pieces during that time. And uh, there are different samples of this work. And this is actually what uh, I've done now, actually, for uh, the first time I decided when COVID started, we're all enclosed, I didn't have anywhere to go. and. Um, I started gluing some cubes and putting some colors in between them, uh, different, sh different compositions with different color combinations and started playing with it back and uh, did a limited edition of pieces that uh, actually are available through Habitat Galleries uh, at a very reasonable price. And there we are. Uh, it's the first uh, piece that uh, I've done in Czech Republic, uh, 97, 98. I decided to go back to, to Czech Republic for the first time because before it was still a communist time and I would go back to jail. Uh, but in 89, the democracy came and all the communist country fell apart. and became democracy and uh, give a pardon to all the political uh, immigrants, refugees that uh, were. So these were some of the first pieces um, that I did in Czech Republic. Started casting and going large in scale. And this is called Picasso. I love this piece. And uh, this is the observer. And then uh, 92, I believe, was the first. Uh, uh, I, I decided to do a really big piece. And uh, I cast the original in plaster and worked on it. And uh, I, I had a show with Sandra Einstein Gallery and a little lecture. Uh, after that with slides and uh, I was showing these slides uh, uh, and uh, there was a person there that came to uh, us and said, well, I really like this big piece and uh, 
how much would cost to make it and to do it. Uh, we really like to commission you to do that. So that's how it happened. Uh, got commissioned to do the first large piece in uh, Toronto. And uh, there it is, uh, it was large scale. And I did two castings out of the, uh, the same piece. Uh, one went to the collector and then the other one actually I cast it for myself, but uh, got purchased uh, by the Imagine Museum. So now it's there at the entrance of the Imagine Museum. And there's some smaller different uh, pieces that I was working and a lot of my work uh, is about the human body, human experiences. Even though in a geometrical forms, uh, I try to bring some softness and movement. And as you can see, the um, physical forms are, this is the piece that was in the, actually uh, in the movie that you show, uh, that I showed uh, how the project is done. Um, that was in blue and this one is in red and this one is in Habitat Gallery. It's a great piece. It's another big... Uh... So I started casting also. First I was working with the Czechs, uh, doing only in Czech Republic all the castings. And then later on I started, uh, I got my beautiful studio here where I had a lot of, it's like about 7,000 square feet. So I had a lot of space and I was able to get a, a large kiln and a smaller one. So I started casting myself um, a lot of work and finishing it up. And um, uh, got really busy with doing it because uh, I did it mostly myself. I I don't have, uh, I had an assistant for two or three years and, but the rest of the time is just me, myself with the forklift. <laughs> so it is uh, a lot of torsos that uh, I really, uh, what we did during the time when I was studying with Libensky was uh, we were drawing every day four hours a day from eight to 12 in the morning. And we had a life model there with, uh, and uh, we were drawing life size. Uh, we had a huge, uh, big stand in front of us and with a chalk call, we were just going and uh, doing a lot of drawings every day for five years. So it, it was uh, really interesting to see how it deeply affected me because uh, later on, I kind of, when I first started, I was uh, very close to uh, Libensky's work and I was trying to, it's hard not to be influenced by him after you study with him for six years, of course. And uh, I wanted to somehow find my own uh, signature. So, uh, that's, uh, that was a hard thing, but I think with these uh, torsos and uh, the smooth lines and the beauty of the, the, the motion, uh, the softness that I tried to bring to a really crystal, to a cold material, uh, I think that uh, was my breakthrough when I was able to do that. This is a great piece. I love this torso five. And we got a, a question for you. A couple yeah, of, if you don't mind jumping in here. Um, yeah. um, how long does it take you to go from drawing to finished product if you were to kind of estimate it? I'm sure it's well, more difficult it, a question than you think. Yeah, it's, uh, it takes about, it's not like two minutes like you saw in the video. I wish it was that fast. <laughs> but uh, it takes... Uh, Let's say if I start working on a piece, uh, start drawing and sometimes the drawing itself, it takes a week, sometimes one hour. Uh, it's hard to predict. Uh, it depends on a lot of circumstances. 
sometimes the muse is kissing me and I'm able to do a lot of pieces, drawings uh, in a short period of time, but sometimes it takes a long time. So let's say I have the drawing and then I start sculpting in clay, then I make the mold. So it will, if I work on a piece constantly, it may take a month and a half, two, if I work on one piece constantly. Great. That's, that means three months, right? I got it. Then, uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then next question is, uh, you kind of answered it, but they asked you if you often work by yourself or have helpers. You mentioned the Hilo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a helper, Stephanie Klo. She was uh, working here for three years and then she moved back to San Diego to her um, fa uh, family. And uh, it was just me, myself. And then I do the castings in Czech Republic. So uh, I contract them to do my castings. I send them the originals and they do the castings themselves. Gotcha. So, Gotcha. A couple more got on this thing. We're going to pound through these because they're great questions. Um, how do you keep the air bubbles out of your work? I'm not trying to keep air bubbles of my work for, to tell you the truth. Uh, it depends on the material I use. Uh, in cast glass, bubbles are fine. They give a little more space uh, and they're more even unique with these bubbles and uh, sometimes if it's too clean it looks like uh, unreal like almost like plastic you know mm -hmm. so uh, i'm not uh, trying to but uh, it depends on the glass if the glass has lead content it tends to push the because it's heavier it pushes the bubbles out and uh, that's why you have less bubbles, like especially in this piece, uh, you see less bubbles because of that. But if the glass is non-leaded, uh, you still get um, some of the bubbles out, but a lot of they, they're just trapped inside. And, uh, right, they're usually quite small too. Um, yeah, they're small, they're not huge bubbles. They're just not giant like some of the Lubinsky works. Um, yeah. What part of your process takes the longest? Cold working. Cold working. It is the longest. And it's very difficult. And you just go back and imagine, you know, working on the piece. And at the moment, it's almost done. Everything fine. Like this piece I've done uh, in a different color here. And I was uh, polishing. The last thing was polishing the flat side in the back. And... Uh, it just got overheated by this machine, the big one that I have, I was, you know, upside down. So I have the surface and I am grinding with the machine and somehow overheated and it just cracked and it was ready. Mm -hmm. The piece was ready. So I had to go back and remelt the whole thing and then grind everything again. Gotcha. Our uh, next question is in your video, when you first create a sculpture, what is it made out of? Uh, first is uh, I sculpt it with clay and gotcha. then I make it in plaster. I cast it in plaster, just the regular plaster. Gotcha. And then um, another one, um, uh, the beautiful gradation in the work, like the piece we're looking at, um, the color, it, uh, the results of removing material, like the depth, what is, well, how come the same color of glass looks different on this piece all the way through? Well, uh, the glass actually depends on the glass. This, uh, this piece particularly is a light amber color that it, uh, it's a single piece of color, of course, but depends on the thickness, it works and it changes. And also depends on the uh, background and the optics behind it because it's all polished. And as you move around, it changes because there is a lot of optical reflections uh, while you walk around it uh, and it changes constantly and it's very playful and the darker the color uh, of course more dense but it needs a lot more light to light it up properly gotcha and you kind of feels like movement in the glass as you move around it yeah and then last question uh, from Howard Cohen oh we got another one after that um, did it take a while for you to develop the formula in the glass you use did you try out various uh, formulations well, I have tried, what I do, I use, uh, it's a kiln casting, so I get billets that are already pre-made for kiln casting 
with different manufacturers. Some are Czech, uh, some are here American, like Bullseye, some are uh, Gaffer from New Zealand, actually they moved also to Portland. And some are Czech from Banas glass, uh, some are from Ornella glass in Czech that has more lead content. So I tried different glasses and uh, some Reichenbach from Germany as well I've tried. A few different. That's great. Well, thank you, Lajazar. We'll save some more questions, but go ahead and continue with your presentation. We'll okay. ask the rest later. Good, good. So anyway, so these are, and, and I do uh, like to use uh, a lot of strong colors, uh, a lot of color. This one is one of the latest pieces that uh, you have in the gallery, this uh, torso. That was another one that I sculpted actually uh, in reverse. It was the most difficult thing. I sculpted uh, the negative form, uh, not the positive, but I sculpted it backwards. So I'm, this is the front and this is the back of the piece. So you can see how it's, uh, a hollow hmm. and uh, entrapped in the prism. So uh, there is uh, uh, one, uh, mm, I did two installations actually in uh, hospitals. I uh, got uh, this one uh, in uh, Boston. Um, and it's interesting, they're both in a cancer centers. Uh, this is uh, in Boston, uh, in the garden, they call it healing garden. So this piece was lit, uh, stainless steel pedestals and lit from within. Uh, and the other one is in New York, in Long Island, in the Stony Brook Hospital at the entrance of also oncology and um, it was at the reception. Uh, it's a big piece, the blue. Then I tried to experiment uh, with a more three-dimensional form that it doesn't have a flat surface, except for the one that it sits on. And uh, the way I did that was I sculpted it and then uh, I actually uh, scanned it, 3D scanning. Uh, and send the original uh, scan to the Czech Republic. And from that, they made a model out of uh, one to one, out of uh, foam, dense foam. And the mold was made from it and uh, that is the piece. So, and uh, this one also went to, uh, that was the first piece actually, the uh, Imagine Museum got, it's called The Birth. And uh, this was a, actually a rendering, computer rendering of the same piece, uh, if it's in glass made, and that was a, rendered by computer, it's not a photograph. Uh, and I did it, uh, the same piece actually, I decided to try in metal. So I did uh, stainless steel and uh, bronze uh, casting of it, uh, polished. So. Um, that was my first uh, try and I think I'm going to try some more of it. And then I uh, experimented in 17, as you can see on the top, uh, trying to uh, learn, which was so hard and I'm still not good and I don't know if I want to ever go back to it, to do it uh, using a computer screen only. And uh, that was uh, done on Maya uh, 3D modeling uh, software. Actually, Maya is for architecture and it's very complex and it's very difficult. So I did uh, a series of those pieces uh, and actually you have them in the gallery, Aaron. Those, there's five pieces that I did or six uh, using that computer and then mm -hmm. sending the file to be done by 3D uh, machines uh, ground down and that's the original and I love this piece it's beautiful anyway that's from the other side 
And you see there's bubbles inside, but it's fine. That's another rendering of a piece that I did is this one. That was another piece and that was, uh, that's how it looks before it's done in glass. And then is the tall blue piece, there it is. And then I decided to do also bigger, larger casting in my studio for the first time. So decided that's my wife <laughs> showing the size of the piece that was supposed to be a door. And this is my Stephanie, my assistant. So we, we did a big mold. That was very difficult uh, to do mold of this size. It was like uh, so big, so heavy. And then, uh, as you can see, the forklift is there to help me move it around and keep it in place and put it in the in the kiln. So that's how it is before I got fired. Then I loaded up with uh, the, the the billets. These are Czech billets from Czech Republic. And then when it's so cast and when I opened the kiln, it looked like that. After wow. the casting, then. Uh, uh, you see in that machine, I was grinding and polishing the whole flat surface. And that's the end of it. And then it uh, was finished in the back and a little small area in the top polished and then encased into a metal frame. And there is the door. We shipped it to actually to Sofa was the first time in Chicago. When was that? Ninety? I forgot them, but um, there it goes to Sofa, and, and that was another lucky for me that it was only one inch clearance on the top when I was putting it in. So we didn't measure the truck how tall it is. <laughs> so when I come to pick it up, I said, "Uh oh." So it worked out perfectly. And that was the display at that time when we were doing the display, I remember with the a little house and the door you went and my booth was in that little house. Anyway, that's uh, the same piece actually. Uh, I did in three different colors and uh, that is the um, another one. And then I, did these renderings, these are computer and they're not uh, in real life, but showing uh, what it could be done with this uh, glass that there is no limit on the size. You can combine different sections uh, with it or use it in different environment. For offices, for restaurants, for houses and doors of course and uh, and there is me with the largest of the last two pieces that i have done in this size that was uh, actually uh, last uh, the summer before last summer and that is the original piece that was over uh, it was six and a half feet or seven feet almost tall and uh, unfortunately, that was supposed to be shown in, uh, in the Habitat Prime in Chicago, uh, w again with the, the other big piece, but uh, this piece got broken in uh, transport from uh, the Czech Republic. They, they both came from Czech Republic, unfortunately. The, and this one survived and uh, it's in the gallery, in Habitat Gallery right now. Then I did another large, I don't know, something about the size that really attracts <laughs> me uh, and the challenges that brings uh, and the expense to make it also. It's really expensive to do a big piece. So, but uh, I did this one and uh, that's also in Czech Republic. Uh, uh, that is uh, Mr. Flanderka, Tomas, uh, who is always, uh, I work with him and uh, the other Tomas uh, for about 20, 23, 24 years already. Uh, we collaborate and we have been together ever since uh, 
great. Uh, he used to work for Libensky Studio when uh, uh, Libensky was there. He was a cold working uh, guy. And the other guy, Tomas, that uh, I work with, he, um, he was the technology expert uh, at the Libensky Brichtura Studio. And he opened his own uh, little shop. He had two houses, one in the backyard and did a lot of kilns uh, in that house and started doing his own casting. So I worked with them and that's the piece when it was still finished. And, and there it is in my studio. A beauty. All right, I think uh, that's it from my presentation. All right, I'm gonna stop your uh, sharing and I got a couple more questions for you. Anybody sure. also welcome to jump in here. Um, technical question, do you make your own mold with silica or plaster or use a commercial mold material? Uh, it is a mold material that was developed uh, um, by uh, friend of mine in, uh, actually who lives in Seattle and it's called cast a lot uh, and it comes in a boxes uh, and it has some fibers in it and some uh, silica sand and some uh, clay as well and plaster so it's a mixture of all those and I mix it up. Gotcha. Um, I'll keep going here. Have you ever worked with dichroic glass? Sorry? Have you ever worked with dichroic glass? Yes, I have. I have, uh, and actually the guy that I worked for, Steve Maslach, he was doing a lot of dichroic, and I was doing all the cold working for him. He was doing cold working uh, sculptures using a lot of dichroic. So I'm very familiar with the dichroic. In the old time, there were two people using it. Uh, before John Q started using it, uh, there were... Um, I forgot their names already, but uh, I'm very familiar with it, but I never used it that much. I like the primary colors better than trying to trick you. Yeah. Uh, I see Charles jumped in here and made a comment in the notes. Charles, you wanna unmute yourself and say hi? Hi. Hello to everybody. Hello to Lachifar, who we had a good conversation with yesterday on the phone. Yeah, uh, we're trying to work out all the details about a brilliant uh, solo show for him in 2021 at the museum. That's great. Yeah, I'm looking forward. So we're we're planning for the future, everybody. Glass will be in museums, and we thank Charles for uh, putting together a show of Latches Eyes. You're all invited to, and we'll send you information about that. Um, yeah. Another question for you: uh, uh, Can you speak about uh, to how you pick and polish the areas of your glass? Is it planned or do you respond to the piece and decide? Uh, I respond to the piece, depends on the piece uh, and depends on the aesthetics, how I like it finished. You know, just for each piece is different. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, another question from Helmira. What is the weight of the doors? The door, uh, the glass itself is 220 pounds and then there is the metal frame that holds it. And uh, I don't know the total weight, to tell you the truth. But gotcha. it's probably another 100 pounds or so. Okay. Um, your work is best displayed in natural light. Um, but at night, how do you suggest that people light it at home? From back, from above, from below? What are your thoughts? Well, the best way, uh, natural light is great during the day. But at night, it goes to sleep because uh, you need the light to go through the piece. For my, my work is designed for the light to go through the piece to see the beauty. Otherwise, uh, it's okay, but uh, it's not very exciting. So the best way to back, it's backlighting it with uh, actually reflecting a small uh, spotlight behind the piece on the wall and have it reflected from the wall to go through the piece. That's exactly what I would have said, but you did it perfectly. <laughs> you worked many times. Um, when you're in the process of mold making, are you imagining the finished color? Yes, usually I am. 
and usually it's the first one I do. But I do sometimes one piece in two colors or three colors, different uh, colors, and it looks all different. Different right. mood. Yeah, complete. Um, people are welcome to jump in and ask questions here too. I'm, I have a couple more, but if you want to mute yourselves, I don't dominate everything, everybody. But I'm happy to continue. Um, when you use uh, a mold and it looks like you saved them up, oh, someone jumped in, go ahead. I have a question and that is, uh, how do you coordinate and work um, uh, with the group in, um, in the Czech Republic? How often do you have to travel and how do you coordinate? Well, uh, in the beginning, when I started uh, doing it, I was uh, making the models here out of plaster and putting in boxes. And I fly with the boxes to Czech Republic, rent a car in the airport and just go there. And uh, we, we talk, we choose the colors, we choose the finish and this and that, all the details. And I leave the originals there. So they take the molds and uh, we communicate during phone and they send me photographs uh, via email always uh, so I know how the things are going. And uh, they're both amazing uh, with technology and they know exactly what they're doing and I have a total confidence that I never, maybe only once it happened that uh, I had a piece from them that was not uh, up to my expectation and I had to redo and finish, but that was in the beginning. And then uh, it all was uh, smooth after that. That's great. Um, mm -hmm. Do you always use the same glass or you do, do you use different types of glass depending on your project? Yeah, depending on the project. Uh, I like the glass with uh, some lead in it, but if, if the piece is too big, it becomes too heavy and that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So if the larger pieces, they're not lead for sure. That's how I usually choose the it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, how do you decide what work you make in your studio and what work is made in the Czech Republic? Well, it depends. It's a hard, uh, depends where I'm at now. If I have a lot of things going on in the studio and grinding and polishing, if I'm too busy or if I don't have enough, then I take it on me and I do the whole thing. So it all varies. Um, Latch, Latch, Latch yep. it, seems, it seems that you're doing more commission work than you are, um, you know, speculative uh, work for uh, different galleries. Am I, is that a correct observation? Not really, no. Yeah. It's uh, more, it's actually what I decide to do and then I do it. Uh, but for the larger pieces, they were commissions. Um, can you help uh, explain the use of your molds? We saw some pieces that were made of the, uh, the, same, uh, the same mold, but different colors. How often do you reuse your mold? Well, I could reuse this mold. That's why it's called cast a lot. Mm -hmm. Because you can cast a few pieces uh, out of the same mold. Gotcha. And it's a great product. Uh, and it deteriorates after a few castings, but you can go three and four castings easily if it's done properly. And those are often... Uh, and if they don't have undercuts, that's the other thing. Gotcha. Mine don't have undercuts. And those are usually different colors in casting, never the same color, or what does it work like that? Uh, different, different colors. Different colors, okay. Yeah. Um, and your smaller works that we saw on the shelf in your office behind you, what are, they, what are the average size of those pieces? Uh, which ones? The, the ones on your, your, uh, your, to your, maybe your right or left? Yeah. This, right. Uh, yeah. Well, they are uh, like, what, 16 inches tall, I think, 16 to 18 inches tall. Gotcha. So very interesting. Very good. All right. That was a lot of great questions from people in the audience. Thank you for, for asking and typing those in. I didn't think of enough, yeah. and I'm glad you guys were able to help. But feel free to jump in now and ask any more.
And if we, uh, we don't have any, then we'd like to say thank you so much to Lachesar today for spending the time with us and putting on a great presentation. I, uh, I really enjoyed seeing the works and seeing your space. What a great space it is. Well, thank you for organizing it, Aaron. You did a great job. Thank you for everybody <laughs> attending. Yes, yes. It's an hopefully we'll see in person some of those days <laughs> in the future. Yeah, that would that's, be good. That's for sure. It's an honor to have you and like it's a, a, a variety of work that's available. And if you want to know about uh, Latches Arts Limited offering, contact me at the gallery anytime or visit habitat.com forward slash limited. Um, again, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you. yourselves thank and say you. hello and goodbye. <laughs> Bye, Latches Thank you. Thank you, you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, presentation. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Uh, so good to see everybody. Great seeing all your faces, everybody. Hi, Marty. Hi, everybody. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. <laughs> wow. Nice to see Hi, you. Hi. 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 Thank you. Hi. 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 Wonderful presentation, really exceptional. Thank you, Jack. That's great. Thank you. Absolutely great. Well, thank you all thank for coming. Thank you for asking my questions, Aaron. <laughs> You're no problem. Yeah. Here to help. <laughs> Keeping them in order was the hard part. They kept popping up. Um, <laughs> be, have a safe weekend, everybody, and take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.